Somebody once told me I was talking too loud tonight, but but anyway, we're going to start right off by we have a lot of things tonight. Uh, we're going to introduce candidates or the representatives. And um, first, we have Chika Anyan, who's running for judge, but I don't remember which district because I don't have you on my paper. Well, I'm uh, the currently the presiding judge of the criminal district court for the seven, the felony court. Um, I've been this is my second term on that bench. Prior to being elected uh, to that bench, I practiced criminal law at the Frank Valley Court Building County uh, for over 20 years. I'm also board certified in criminal law by the board specialization. I am running currently court for criminal cases. Um, I don't have a primary opponent, and so I'm here just to support the Democratic Party, um, you know, just to see all the candidates that are running. But I will be on your ballot anyway, so vote Democratic. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have um, two candidates, a representative of, of Cass Hernandez, Mariah Froming, uh, running for Texas 115, which would be replacing Julie Johnson. Hopefully she goes on to US 32. So do you want to come up here, Cass? Okay, okay. I'm going to see if I can turn and they can see you. Thank you. And next we have uh, Kate Rumsey, who's running against Cass Hernandez. Really exciting. Um, I'm proud to be the only hometown candidate in this race. I was raised in Carrollton, went to public schools in CFDI and CFDI and down the road. I now live in Cuphall, where I'm raising my family. We um, came to the district because of the public schools. That is a huge reason why I am running to make sure that we have safe, fully funded public schools in our district, which I know Tracy's going to be talking about in a, in a couple minutes. Um, but I was recently endorsed by the Dallas Morning News. Uh, they emphasized my service history. I am an Air Force officer. I'm a JAG. I've taken an oath to the Constitution, and I really mean that. Uh, I really care about our democracy. I want to make sure we have one. I want to make sure Donald Trump's not elected come this fall. Um, I was a federal prosecutor. I worked for the federal government. I started with the Obama administration. And the Dallas Morning News talked about a case of mine that really made me want to run for office this year. It was a gun trafficking. I couldn't find a law that a gentleman from Flower Mound violated. And I thought, this is wrong. He's trafficking firearms to our cartel. How can I not find a law that he's violated? I got him on a license. And I said, he could do what he was doing, but he needed a license to do it. But that's wrong. I cannot enforce laws that don't exist. And therefore, if I run for office one day, maybe I can create those laws that we really needed in that case. And countless others. That's why I'm going. So thank you. And I hope to see you all at the doors. I've been knocking all over the district. I'm now I'm going back to the district. And um, I've been all over uh, 115, including Carrollton, my hometown. I'm so excited to meet everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have a, a very special presentation by Julie Johnson. Uh, for Caroline, Caroline 
December, right? The other way. And um, and one thing I will mention, Julie may mention it as well, but uh, Ralph wrote a book called uh, Freedom is Not Free. And Ralph has, a, he, he was in his mid nineties. He, he has had life experiences that are pretty much unimaginable to most of us. Uh, got, escaped from Nazi, Nazi Germany, got worked with the American Friends Institute to get uh, American Friends to, Quakers to get other people out, ended up come, ending up in the United States, enlisted in the military, got his citizenship the day he enlisted so he could go fight. He was in the, um, I want to say OSS, but that's not the right term. But he was involved in information gathering. Ralph was just a hero. And, but he wrote this interesting book, which is, uh, Carolyn brought a couple copies tonight. It's also available on Amazon for $20 and she's also selling it for $20, but you can get it uh, paperback for 20, hardcover for 30, but it is, um, freedom is not free. And it starts with a picture of the Nazi flag and goes through to the American flag. And I think this is something that's very pertinent right now, because you know when we have you saying, Russia, go ahead and attack NATO. We don't care. We're not going to do anything because they didn't pay their bill. Um, it's just stunning. And we have a whole political party that's opposed to helping Ukraine where we are not wasting, we're not using, no American young men are being lost, but we're giving weapons. We're also testing our weapons. We're seeing how effective they are. So we have a lot of pluses there, but we have a whole Republican party that uh, is, is basically saying we don't want to support them. And I think that... Um, it's it's important for us to see things like read things like freedom is not free because th this is not a new occurrence. What's going on now is not dissimilar from what happened in the 1930s and in, in, in 20s and 30s. And we need to be aware of that. And as Democrats, we if we're here, we probably are. But anyway, Julie has something special for Carolyn, and then we'll move on to Tracy's part of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Stacey, so I can see you on the picture. Huh? Stacey, so I can see you on the picture. Oh, you want me to stay over here? If you don't mind. Because I don't mind. I will stay right here and uh, follow all the rules for once. No. It just helps last oh, month. Last month, last month <laughs> Zoom was a disaster. Thank you, guys. It's so great to see you again um, as your representative for House District 115. It is great to be here. And I'm so thrilled that we have two. two stellar candidates running to fill my shoes and my so proud of is house 115 has one of the highest voter turnouts in the state of texas and that is because this room has worked hard we worked hard together to beat matt rinaldi and to flip this seat and to take it back but we've held on to it despite a lot of republican attempts to take it back but it's because of the hard work of so many of you in this room. And, you know, uh, both of them have my cell phone. I've spoken to both of them. They can both call me um, and uh, about issues. And one thing that we'll, I will pledge to you for sure is that whoever wins this primary will, will have my unconditional support um, as we transition from them to assume the role of House. And as uh, hopefully I will assume the role of being a United States Congresswoman representing Carrollton, Farmers Branch, Addison, Plano, Richardson, Garland, Mesquite, Bob Springs, <laughs> Dallas. And it goes on and on and on. <laughs> and I just wanted to take one moment to thank Mary Claire for setting the record straight on some untruths that one of my opponents has been saying. You guys, I appreciated your comments so much to say that we elected her. She's our Democrat and that this is, we're not having it. And I really appreciate so much support because um, it's, it's hard enough to run for office. It's really hard to do this. It's a lot of time. It's an incredible sacrifice to your families, to your friends. You make everybody get involved. You know, my friend Dolph has to block walk for me every all the time and has election after election after election. And when it's your own side of the of the field saying things that aren't true, it's deeply disturbing. And the reward is when the people that know you the best stand up for you and say, hell no, that is not true. We're not having it. And so thank you so much for well, that. It's, it's 
people who send them stuff and said this is who they were. Yeah. It's just not true. Yeah. But I appreciate you all so much and make sure you vote a week from tomorrow, if you can believe it. Um, but I am here tonight as your state representative to honor one of the most special people who has resided in House 115, Ralph Hockley. I got to know Ralph when I was first running and he just would put me through the paces, you know? Everybody knows Ralph and he just grilled me up one side and down another. And then he looked to me goes, okay, you're solid. You got my vote. And support that words of encouragement, that piece of wisdom. And, you know, when I learned of his passing, I wanted to do something. So we have a, an opportunity when we're in the Texas house to create resolutions um, honoring someone. And so I authored this res resolution it got passed by the House and it is signed by the Speaker and myself. And I want to, so it's an official resolution under passed with the laws of the state of Texas honoring this great man. And so I would like to read it to you all. It's a, it, it's a little bit of a minute, but I think Ralph deserves it. And so Carolyn, I'd like to present this resolution to you honoring your beloved Ralph. Okay. From the state of Texas House of Representatives resolution. Whereas U.S. Army Colonel retired Ralph Hockley of Dallas, a Holocaust survivor who distinguished himself through his exemplary service to his fellow citizens, passed away on November 8, 2023, at the age of 98. And whereas born as Rudolf Martin Hockenheimer, on October 17, 1925, Jewish household in Karlsruhe, Germany, after Adolf Hitler rose to power, he and his family sought refuge in Marseille, France, only to once again find themselves under threat when the Nazis invaded France in May of 1940. Mr. Hockley was targeted for being a German immigrant and held in various internment camps. And whereas unable to return to school, Mr. Hockley used his German, English, and French language skills to become an interpreter for the American Friends Service Committee, a Quaker-run organization that helped refugees escape Nazi Germany and occupied France. Mr. Hockley went on to use his connections to the Quakers and the U.S. consulate to secure visas for himself and his family. After a long voyage across the Atlantic Ocean, the Hockleys arrived in New York on June 30th, 1941. And on whereas on the day he turned 18 years old, Mr. Hockley enlisted in the U.S. Army, and he was eventually deployed to Europe for assignments in port security and counterintelligence. In May of 1946, he concluded his active duty service at the rank of sergeant and remained in the Army Reserve. He subsequently earned a bachelor's degree in Soviet studies from Syracuse University before returning to active duty during the Korean War. He served in seven campaigns in Korea, included, including as a forward observer for the French United Nations forces during the Battle of Heartbreak Ridge. In recognition of his valorous actions in that war, he earned a Bronze Star Medal with a V device as he continued his career in the US intelligence in West Germany until 1981. He accepted the Legion of Honor, France's top civilian honor in 2021. And whereas from an early age, Mr. Hockley actively sought out service opportunities in a number of organizations, including the Free French Youth Association and the United Nations Appeal for Children. For more than 70 years, he was a member of the Reserve Officers Association of the United States, in which he held various offices. He further served as president of the San Francisco Police and as a chapter president of the Korean War Veterans Association. In 2000, he published a book about his military career and his experience living in Nazi Germany, Freedom is Not Free. He resided in the Dallas area for a decade before his passing, and he had recently begun sharing his story with visitors to the Dallas Holocaust Museum and Human Rights Museum and with other adult and student groups. 
whereas Mr. Hockley met his first wife, fellow Holocaust survivor, Eva Frankel in Oakland, California, and the couple shared in the joy of raising two children, Clifford and Denise. After her death in 1983, he was fortunate to find love a second time with the former Carolyn Glover Harris, his wife of nearly four decades, he was blessed with a blended family that included children, step-grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Whereas after bearing witness to one of the darkest chapters in history, Ralph Hockley courageously stepped forward to serve his adopted country and to defend the cause of freedom. And those he leaves behind will ever, will forever find inspiration in their memories of this extraordinary man. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Texas House of Representatives of the 88th Texas Legislature hereby pay tribute to the life of Ralph Hockley and extend heartfelt sympathy to the members of his family, to his wife, Carolyn Glover Hockley, to his children, Clifford Hockley and Denise Hockley, and to his stepchildren, Chris, Heidi, Hargis, and Dr. Kurt Harris, and to his grandchildren, step great ah, grandchildren, and to his other relatives and friends. And be it further resolved that an official copy of this resolution has been prepared for his family and that when the Texas House of Representatives adjourns for the day, it did so in memory of Ralph Hockley. Signed by me. So it is my absolute honor to present this certificate. <laughs> you know, it's, it's servants like his is why we all need to vote. It is why we care about our, elect, our process, our democracy. And I think about him frequently, actually, you know, when we're on a campaign trail, we interact with people who say, you know, I'm not voting, I don't care, or, or even worse, I support Trump. Um, you know, but one of the things that's so special about Metro Press Democrats and this group of people is we come together collectively out of mutual respect and desire for the values that we all share that, that Ralph embodied like no other. So thank you so much. <laughs> And more democratic. Thank you. Actually, I just, this is not on the same topic, but because um, Ralph was just, you could talk about him forever. But there's a candidate running in 115 besides Cass and Kate Rumsey, uh, Scarlett Cornwallis, who declared early, has, is unreachable, has done nothing except put up signs. And she's a candidate who's likely to try to force a runoff. And so it's important when you vote to pay attention to Scarlett Cornwallis and not vote for her. Because she's she's not there for, I mean, she may be a Democrat, but she's not doing anyone a service. She's not doing anyone a service at all. She's just, and her husband's doing somewhat the same in another district. So against you, is it against you? Yeah. I know, I knew. I mean, he was, he was, he was in one thing and then he moved around. He moved around a lot. He's run for numerous things over the years. But just to be aware of Scarlett Cornwallis's, don't do that. There's nothing else, nothing else, just these big four by four signs. So just be aware of that because. And they're both they're both from Plano. They're both from Collin County, so they moved in to do that. Okay, now we'll get to which is uh, Tracy Fisher, who is a four-term uh, Capel ISD board member. She ran for the State Board of Education, 
and didn't win, which is very difficult because it covers how many counties? Five 19. counties? 19 counties. So you have to be in all those counties. And, and some of them are very, you know, very rural, very conservative. And so it's very hard to win over the way it's set up and to sort of stop the foolishness that goes on with Greg Abbott. But Tracy is a member of Mothers Against uh, Greg Abbott. She's very active. <laughs> she's active. And, um, and she's going to talk to us about vouchers because Greg Abbott right now is holding meetings in apartment complexes where you have to RSVP to get in there with different representatives, Republican representatives, uh, whom he's supporting who to, to talk about vouchers. And Trace, I'll let Tracy go on more with it, but Greg Abbott is actively campaigning and he, he called several, well, they, the, the legislators were in session for 10 months. Usually they're there for six months, maybe one extra. But, oh, I, was, I mean, endless, right? And how many of the sessions were just devoted to vouchers too? We had a regular session, we had four sessions. All related to vouchers? And, uh, yeah, vouchers was up in, in all, all of them. them. Yeah. And yeah. And as I mentioned in the, which is good. And he just got $6 million from a donor in Pennsylvania who wants to push vouchers, which why would he care about? It? But apparently he does. I, anyway. I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Tracy and then Tracy will answer questions, right? You, well, you will, answer. you will answer I questions. Will answer. <laughs> and again, Carolyn has books for a couple books for sale, but you get them on Amazon. Yeah, I just bought one on Amazon and very excited to read it. When I finish the book I'm reading and right now, Julie, you'd love this, Mr. Texas. You, so many books I've read about. It's about, it's Lawrence Wright. And what, what book did he write? That big book um, about Texas. He's a Texas guy. It was, uh, this one's about the Texas. Office. But uh, I was trying to think of what else he has written. But he's, I think you're supposed to guess who people are. Um, so much fun. Thank you for inviting me to come. Um, I, this is my favorite topic. No, not really. Public education is my favorite topic. Uh, vouchers are not, but vouchers are something that we're dealing with. And, and our legislature has been fighting about vouchers for more than 20 years. It's been behind the scenes in some places. It's been all kinds of places. Um, but the vouchers have been pushed thanks to wealthy West Texas fracking billionaires and billionaires who um, want to buy up our state. And they're, they're doing it by buying up candidates and Greg Abbott's evidently on the trail now for the West Texas and the Pennsylvania billionaires. So um, we saw that handiwork, Julie alluded to it, um, back in House District 115 in, and in uh, Senate District 16 in 2014, when uh, Matt Rinaldi and Don Huff squeaked into our district. It took them four, very happy about that, at least it was awful, but we made it through. Um, and thankfully we got rid of both of them in 2018 and we got our, I always said we were uh, represented by Johnson and Johnson, but we, uh, we had uh, Julie and Nathan Johnson who we couldn't have chosen better candidates or better representatives for us. Unfortunately, we do have another hill to climb with a recent gerrymandering, but at least our state rep will be a Democrat if we continue to drive voting. So that, that's a really, a really good thing for us. Um, Unfortunately, we're an island. I feel like sometimes it's sad. Um, in 2023, there were, as Julie mentioned, there were four special sessions by the governor to pass vouchers in Texas. A vote was taken, finally, and 23 Republicans joined the Democrats against vouchers. Abbott is out for revenge, as Mary Claire alluded to. A new billionaire from Pennsylvania just gave him all that money. Um, and all they're doing is trying to pick off these, he, you have to call them good Republicans because it's like good MAGA. I mean, there's nothing good about MAGA, but um, but they are they at least vote for against vouchers and vouchers. Pardon. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I guess. Yes. So you can't go much further than the topic of education with most of them for us, but um, but at least they're fighting for vouchers. And and you know, honestly, the reason that they're they're fighting for vouchers is because they live in rural counties. Again. 
I'm sorry, against vouchers, I get so confused. That's how they do it to us. They, they throw that word out and then that's all we think about and we forget to put the rest of the stuff in it. But they know that their communities love their Friday nights. They know that they're the biggest business often in their communities. And they know that their teachers sit in church next to them and they know that they have to listen to their old principal who will who probably took him out behind the woodshed at some point. Um, but they they also think that using um, public money for Christian private schools is unconstitutional, which is constitutional. Um, and they also have said that there's no accountability for this money, and we all know that, and they are correct with that. So there's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now, and that's why I'm talking about Republicans, because there aren't enough Democrats in office yet. So we have to be aware of the political environment and what we're dealing with here and be smart and strategic. What's great is that we know we can go to the polls and vote in the Democratic primary. But unfortunately, there are some prime, there are some Democrats that don't have that luxury because they have to vote against the worst of the things that are offered to them, which is a really sad state of affairs right now in this in this day. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick school funding lesson. I only dedicated a little paragraph to it, not a minute, less than that. Quick school, um, okay, schools are funded by local taxes, state taxes, and federal money. The state decides how much money the locals get to keep so much per student. Anything collected locally over the amount goes to the state's general fund. If you don't educate children, you don't keep the funds that were collected to educate children. We all know about Robin Hood, right? Some people have been affected. 10 to 15 years ago, that excess money would have, then it went to charter schools. And now they keep it for the general fund. The state contributes whatever the legislature decides in each session. Here's a sidebar. There's not been a cost of living adjustment for public schools since 2019. Has anybody seen the cost of living go up since 2019 yeah so teachers have to be paid you know and 86 percent of those budgets are teacher pay i mean it's unbelievable they are woefully public schools are woefully underfunded there is one pot of money for all education the federal government helps provide some special education funding and protections with idea and free and reduce lunches, et cetera. This is where we are, and the governor wants to vouched and destroy public schools. And if anybody has a doubt about that, then, well, you need to spend more time in my car with me. <laughs> People don't like to do that. I talk too much. All right. If vouchers are passed, spe um, the Special ed children will lose all protection laws from the federal government if they choose to go to a private school. There's no protection for them. If vouchers are passed, charters have been a station that I could spend hours on. Those students receive about $1,100 extra per student than the local public schools. Charters will likely flip Get this, charters will likely flip to private schools without local um, accountability to act, um, so that they can access even more funding. Students already return to their public schools behind in fifth and sixth grades most, like, most normally to be caught up. The charter schools get about $6,400. Uh, I'm sorry, the public school, well, I'll tell you that. I'm gonna see, this is what I do. I wrote this stuff down so I don't get off track so that I make sure that I tell you what I need to tell you. So I'm going back here. All right, Houston, we have a problem. Defund, they don't wanna increase funds. They don't let locals increase funds either. Degrade STAR, the testing system. It is a farce. It is a scam just like vouchers are a scam. It tests your socioeconomic status. It doesn't, it doesn't test your ability to learn or what you're learning. And what's happened is it's pushed all of our kids into classrooms where they are having to be taught to the test and retaught and retaught. It's a system, a cycle that needs to be stopped. 
And then the third thing, again, defund, degrade, and then destroy. And that's what vouchers are. They're the tipping point. They will take us, they will take us out. There's some myths and facts about vouchers. There are a lot of smart people out there looking at other states. A lot of really good researchers. Josh Cohen is a gentleman from Michigan State. He has studied this. That's where Betsy DeVos came from, right? So he has been looking at this a long time. The myths are parents will have the ultimate accountability. That's a myth. The next myth is we need school choice for underserved children in poor performing schools and for special education children. That's how Arizona started theirs was for a few special ed kids. And the third one is school choice won't hurt public education. The facts are schools will choose, not parents. Since the enactment of universal school voucher program, states have been struggling with program cost and lack of transparency and accountability. Arizona, for example, began with 150 students. They're now at 100,000 kids. The original estimate for these vouchers there were $65 million eventually. They are spending nearly a billion dollars on vouchers. That they had a really full um, treasury <laughs> in Arizona, you know, they don't now. Um, no, you're fine. Um, I didn't turn off mine either. I, well, maybe. Okay. okay. Florida has 170,000 kids receiving vouchers, which has diverted 1.5 billion from public to private schools. Again, there's one pot of money. Texas public schools educate 10% of the students in this country. We are a cash cow. That's why Pennsylvania is pitching in some money and all these billionaires pitching in money. And I try really hard not to watch Netflix anymore because of Reed Hastings, but all these billionaires from all these different places are pitching in. I haven't heard that my alma mater person, um, uh, Warren Buffett has been pitching money into this. I hope I never hear that. I don't think I will hear that. He's a good guy. But the other billionaires aren't good guys. Um, most of them, I don't know. Maybe somebody in here, the billionaire next door, please don't accept my apology right now. Um, our already underfunded public schools receive $6,400 for a basic student education. And that money will be drained. Overwhelmingly school vouchers um, in these states where they've in enacted them, are being used by families with children already in private schools to subsidize their tuition. 70 to 80% will be new needs without a funding stream, except for where we are in our general fund that you, you contribute locally to the public schools. So they're gonna take that money from the general fund and it's going to reduce the pot. There's only one. Voucher programs, skyrocketing costs, divert funding, not only from public schools, but also from other critical public services. Think about that. We're not just talking about schools being destroyed. We're talking about public libraries. We're talking about water. We're talking about roads. We're talking about anything they can't privatize, right? I mean, we already do a lot of roads. Uh, we already do a lot of, a lot of things. Anyway, it's, it's really, we're in a, we, we do have a problem. The Texas Constitution, Article 7, some people don't seem to care much about that, but at least at the legislature, calls for a free and efficient public education. There is nothing efficient or free about a voucher program. It will cost all of us much more to educate kids, and many won't even receive an education at all. What kind of Texas are we facing? That's all I have on vouchers because it makes me sick and I don't want to talk about it anymore. And I'm happy to yeah. answer any questions. But before I do, because it's something really important, I have three announcements and one resource. All right. It's in the stores right now. All right. After you buy that book, because I'm very excited about it. Um, first announcement is there's a group called Grandparents for, they have a website and a Facebook page. It's just that grandparents for public schools. I think it's dot org. Um, if you are a grandparent or if your children have a grandparent, you might let them know about this organization. I would highly encourage it. 
The other one I want to tell you about is this Mothers Against Greg. You didn't get to sign up when you came in because I came in a little bit late and I forgot to put the sign-up sheet there. But on your way out, if you're interested, and we even take men. So men, <laughs> don't tell it, don't tell Nancy. We even take men. Um, you'll want to participate in their anti-fascist book club. That's actually it's really fun. We're gonna do Mr. Texas on Sunday. Um, the last one we did was on tyranny. It was Rick Snyder, who is a historian, and he knows a lot about Ukraine, and he talks about how we need to look to, we need to, look to re re Ukraine when we're in these dire straits, because they're showing us three things. They're showing us how to be you know, courageous, they're showing us how to be calm, and they're showing us that we need to get involved in something more than we did yesterday, right? You don't have to be the biggest superstar. You don't have to go run for state rep and then run for Congress and be a federal jag or you know anything like that. You just need to do something extra. So anyway, it was a great book. I highly recommend it. It's very short. Um, all right. So uh, we also are going to have local meetings and local. Uh, there's going to be a local chapter Facebook page soon. So that's exciting and it's about North Texas and we can talk about all this stuff and figure out what we wanna to do to help our candidates get in. All right, um, and they just recently endorsed Julie Johnson for her role with all those 10 people there, they endorsed Julie Johnson. So congratulations. All right, the third uh, note is tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in Coppell at the Coppell Arts Center, there will be a House District 115 candidate forums. All candidates were invited. The forum, this is really cool. I don't know, if, in the world of education, this is a big deal. The, the forum is being hosted by the North Texas Commission. So that's business people across North Texas. And Raise Your Hand Texas. Now, you talked about a billionaire, Charles Butts organization. He runs HEB, wonderful human being. He's probably the richest guy in Texas that's supporting public schools. So Raise Your Hand Texas. And um, North Texas Commission are hosting this, and the Texas Tribune will be moderating it. So this is a big deal. They're excited about this, right? Um, all right. And then I had a resource for you. Besides this wonderful book that I bought on Amazon, just um, read the mark. 2024 Texas into a Christian theocracy. The biggest Texas oil man, Tim Dunn, engaged in a, yeah, exactly. We shouldn't say it's like Baltimore. We shouldn't say that. This, this audience may not know Baltimore, but the, um, the biggest Texas oil man, Tim Dunn, is engaged in a holy war against public education, renewable energy, something else we care about, and non-Christians. He's a horrible human, be human being. Pick that up, read it, so you know about this man. And um, and that's all I've got. So if you have questions about vouchers or anything else, I have big, strong opinions about everything. <laughs> the who? Oh, the Catholic fish. Yeah. Students attend small Catholic school, but they have a thousand kids in the religious ed program that attend the local public schools. What are they saying? That has anyone said? So are you just ignoring the thousand children who attend yeah. your public schools and just serving the two hundred in your Catholics? That I mean, that's a great question. I don't think it's every Catholic. It is, and there are reasons. And I believe, and Julie might know more than, than I do about it, but. It surprised me what, I mean, you know, unfortunately there are, you know, the people are losing kids in these private Christian schools and meal ticket money, meal ticket. Yeah, it's Julie. All, it's all about the funding. Yeah. And they're just trying to, the whole effort is trying to take the public funds, put them in a private room and Catholic, you know, Catholic private schools are doing it. Yeah. You know, they, they want the public money to pay for their schools and, and, and go to the conference the same way that 
any other religious school does, any other non-religious school does. You know, in a lot of ways, you could look at what's happened when we privatized prisons. You know, Texas is, you know, a private prison, all of our prisons are privately owned, mm -hmm. which is now why we have this, this whole prison pipeline problem, because the prisons, they don't want people to not be in the prison. Mm -hmm. And so that's one, one of the reasons why we have this social justice and this criminal justice problem that we do. And so they're just wanting to privatize public education. It's all about the money. Yeah, it's it. And the, the Republican civil war that's happening right now is something we really do need to pay attention to. That does not mean you should go vote in the Republican primary. Not, not, not here, not here. Not do it. Not do it. Well, there's not, um, the thing is that you have, when you start switching primaries and stuff like that, there's just not enough, and it messes up the whole, whole Democratic primary. There's a very important races on the Democratic primary side, too. And what we really need to do is elect the best candidates we can who are going to win general elections, you know, before we won 16. Because people didn't think that, that we could win this. So we did. Mm -hmm. And that's just what needs to happen. Is we have to spend our resources not as Democrats, be good Democrats, and, 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 and preach the gospel of why we need people to vote in the Democratic Party. And, and, and just, you know, we should have a whole meeting on how to talk about Joe Biden and, and oh, yeah. the general election. And, that would be good but, and this especially 115 we gotta get we, yes sir uh, so. i yeah yes yeah, so what, what, um, what if anything that came up about having a chaplain in school oh. instead of a like yeah, well, that that's yeah that that um I don't think any of the districts in 115 voted to do that. There's a deadline of March 1st. I think that all the school districts had to vote. Of course, it's all about elections, right? They want them to vote in March, put people up to run against the school board members. I mean, it's nuts. It's all it is a every end and upside down way we can do this. We are doing it. They are. Vicious, they are vicious. Um, let me ask him, and then I'll get to. You. Um, we need to brand things better. Somehow, Republicans have a school choice. Yeah. Yeah. School choice is a great idea. Yeah. Have more school for, uh, science schools and arts schools, and like for, I, I went to a public school. Um, but the school boards there, things like. This school, everybody wears a uniform. It's the charter of that school. It's a completely public school. Mm -hmm. And you get to choose where you can go within within reason. I mean, that's that's really what we should be trying to do in Texas. Well, letting people choose where they can send their kids, but have it entirely in the public. Yeah, that's what happens right now in Texas. You can go to a magnet school, you can go to a charter school, you can go to a public school, you can go to a, a public a rural district. Right. It easier to do in a rural well, the you rural districts. Yeah. Right. I know Wise County is a little rural county that we are part of with our Senate district, which who, oh my God, exactly. So Wise County, all those schools, all those school districts, you can go to any of them you want to. The problem is then it becomes segregated. Because this one only allows this right, but it's school choice. Yeah, but but the problem is whatever system it is, it's not the parents because some of those parents will be rejected. Some of those kids won't get to go. Some of those kids will be kicked out of those schools or those special programs because they want people who are easy to.
coach and teach and all the choice that's in public schools. And that's been going on for the last probably five years talking about that because we have strong CTE programs now that we never had before. And except for when I was a kid and we had shop and things like that. Now there are CTE and the, and the state actually gives you more money, which is good for the state. That's one good thing because of the legislature, the good people in the legislature, um, where we have CTE and they give us more funding for that work. So that's uh, uh, career technical education. Is it, in, is it engineering education? I never remember. It, that includes STEM. It includes anything that's not basic stuff. Irving has a lot of programs. Yes, it. Irving has Car great programs. Mechanics. You know, Louisville has great I mean, all of our school districts have really great um, programs and options for, for kids. Yeah, yeah. You. Okay. All the different. Yeah, they support all the schools, but the difference is they take way little money from the local schools because they don't support religious money. But everything else they cover. Almost equal to the post. Yeah, yeah. every state's different. I, I don't know what the New York Constitution says. My husband was raised in New York and he took regent exams. I'm yeah. sure everybody takes a regent. Yeah. Well, that's not what's being pitched here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go by. Yeah, well, it, it, Texas has really great public schools and they are, they're, they're getting killed. Yeah, right, right. I, I will, yeah, I'm not going to pick up the banner for vouchers ever, ever. So you're talking to the wrong person, but I understand what you're saying. You should run for office and then you go negotiate. No, oh. <laughs> And it, like and it wasn't because of your question, it's, right? It's <laughs> yeah, you're, you you have a good heart. You're trying to solve the problem. I get it. I, I got a New Yorker in my family. Yeah. Yes, sir. Julie says, but, right, but really, what is their yeah. that, that, they, uh, that Texas monthly article will be enlightening to you. It'll it'll get into it. But um, it's he they do want um, this Christian nationalism yeah. idea to become yeah. come to fruition. He has a compound. I mean, all those guys out there, they have compounds. They're buying up land in Montana and other places where they can buy lots of land. And I don't know what they want to do with it. Uh, worries me a little bit, um, but he, it, it is about let's, we need the legislature to do our bidding. And they have been plucking these guys off one by one for years and years. Craddock, remember when Craddock was a speaker? Um, you know, he, he got knocked out because of this nonsense stuff and some other things, some other nuances, but, um, and then Joe Strauss came in and Joe was a really good spe uh, speaker. And then he got, you know, whatever they call it. What do they call it when they? Stabbed in the back. Yeah, stabbed in the back by the Republican <laughs> Party. Like he was this horrible human. They probably had pictures of him on billboards because of his faith or whatever. But, um, and and actually Speaker Thielen, that's Speaker now, I called Julie when they elected him. I went, you're kidding, you elected him? And, um, but, you know, he stood up and he has been a pretty strong speaker, I think, to um, maybe he's not great, but he's not as, it, it, well, that he did impeach him. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. He's not Johnson, right? You're getting ready to meet a new Johnson. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait for the fireworks. Um, okay, anything? Yes. I was just going to give a little public service announcement on behalf of the public schools in our area. Um, I'm an educator. My husband is an educator. He's the principal at Early College High School. It's um, a Carrollton Farmers Branch school. It's on the campus of Brookhaven College, 
we're ending campus. Mm -hmm. Um, the mission of Early College High Schools is for first generation college attenders to have the opportunity to attend school where they can receive both their uh, high school diploma and an associate's degree in four years. Um, it's pretty rigorous. When they attend an early college high school program, they're no longer on their homeschool campus, so they don't really participate in band or football or sports. But many of these kids are DACA kids. Um, and when they finish the program and 90 something percent of them graduate, most of them do get the associate's degree, not all, but most do. Um, and then many of them get very big scholarships to go to finish their bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to help the students who would otherwise never have an opportunity to go to college. Uh, part of the program helps the students with everything from filling out FAFSA, uh, scholarship forms, because their families have no experience with it. So they give them all of these opportunities to succeed. And that's one of the best ways that we can help students um, achieve higher education. And to think of voucher systems coming along and then, you know, it's hard enough to get those kind of programs known. I mean, we didn't know about it until Timothy became the principal there. And then we're like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, it's just success after success. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how we can be better cheerleaders for our own schools, but but we do have school choice. And we just got to get people to know about it. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. You said this only for first generation kids? Well, the majority are first generation. It kind of depends. There is an application for... Um, and you can have parents who have gone to college, but if you have other at-risk factors, you can be uh, accepted. Mm -hmm. So it's not exclusive, um, but that is sort of the original intent, um, especially because we're a border state with so many um, immigrants with families who don't really have the opportunity to help them go to college. And, and so, the other school districts that don't have early college high school, a lot of them have dual credit. Right. And so you can still get your associate's degree before you graduate from high school in that case as well. Right. So there's lots of paths through our public schools, plus all the extracurriculars that we offer. I'm sorry. This is where these kids learn life skills. Be in the band. Don't practice. Guess what happens? You you learn some life skills. So, I mean, not that I know any kids that ever had that happen to them, but, 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 you know, those kinds of things are how we get along in the world, right? Getting excited, teamwork, you know, working together, doing things, um, whether it's arts, the arts, fine arts, um, you know, um, solar car opportunities, you know, all kinds of cyber security. There's teams and competitions to see which High school kids are doing the best in cybersecurity and they're out there and we need them and we're growing kids for this world, not for that world of Tim Dunn, not for that world of get the basics. We just need you to know the basics so that we can then teach you whatever else we need to do, you know? And so that's what I worry about a lot. There, Keller ISD, this was just, I don't know if everybody, anybody saw this, but Keller ISD, of course, they've got a crazy school board now, but they are under a $28 billion, uh, million, dollar, they're facing a $28 million deficit budget for next year. Most of our districts are doing this, and hopefully they can get one more special session after the election, maybe, and get some funding for kids, and hopefully Abbott gets that message loud and clear when we push back against all this. But if we don't get school funding, we're in a world of hurt. And um, when Keller is facing their $28 million deficit budget, of course, since they're crazy people, the first things they did is they cut 28 libraries out of their school district. That's all of them. They have no libraries. Beginning in the fall, they'll have no libraries in, in Keller ISD. So if you have friends that live there, tell them to move <laughs> anywhere but there. <laughs> no, not, not here. Yeah, we will. Ha, <laughs> <laughs>
Um, anything else? I mean, honestly, I could. I know. You got a lot of information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thank you for the questions and your attention. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention just occurred to me. I mentioned that the last time we had a meeting, we had an endorsement meeting for Michelle Beckley versus Denise Wooten. She won by 98%. So there was one vote for Denise, basically, which was her vote. And uh, and it seems to be her only goal is winning, interested in winning the primary. But our goal is not winning the primary. I mean, yes, of course, but it's to also unseat the Republican, to flip that seat. And I think it's really important to be aware of that. And uh, we made a donation as a club to Michelle. Julie's been a big donor to Michelle. And I think it's really important um, to hold on to the seats we have, uh, to, you know, to win what we've got and hold those seats, but also to flip, flip seats. So um, for those of you that live in Carrollton, north of in the Denton County, that's something to consider. Also, this is just, I'm kind of interested in this. Uh, on February 18th, uh, Michelle is holding, um, uh, it's like a block walk, which you won't, don't really have to block, walk, but she's also gonna have Jasmine Crockett there. You're gonna be the two right, Julie? No. On the 18th, on the 18th um, at the Prairie House in Louisville. And Jasmine Crockett is, I mean, you're not in the house yet, but you know, you will be, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> And Jasmine is pretty, she's pretty dynamic. I mean, I think she's possibly the only one that's ever said shit on the house floor. <laughs> and so it's an interesting opportunity to at least meet Jasmine if you're interested uh, and if you have the time. And it, to find out about it, you go to Michelle, Michelle's website. But uh, thank you all so much for being here, for all your attention, for being such a great group of people. And yes. Michelle and I have several things that overlap. Yes. And so if you guys are interested in helping both of us, um, we would love to get you to help us out. Yeah. Even my daughter, uh, who you may know, Claire, who has Down syndrome, has been helping walk Capel for Michelle. I drive her around. I say, this store, that door says, oh, my God, it's a hill. <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't seen apartments where you have to go to the third floor yet. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't think she will. But, but you know, everybody... We all have to work, you know, not all of us are ready to block walk. Some of us can phone bank, some of us can donate. We have lots of choices, but unless we do those things, you know, when you're fighting a force like Tim Dunn, who can put millions, millions and millions year after year uh, into his supporting his ideas. Uh, but, you know, he's only one vote. This room has what, 40 votes? He's one vote. And that's important to remember. They can put a lot of millions in, but there's still just one vote. And so um, thank you for coming and oh by the way I should forget if you haven't re-upped your membership and you want to become a member or just you can attend if you don't want to be a member but uh mm -hmm. we love it when you're a member because we use the money for things like supporting candidates and uh well running the club you know mail email service and all that stuff but um don't forget there are forms there if you don't want to do that you pay for the credit card you can do it online and uh if you do it online just make sure you sign up uh, for um, like an email transfer to the people who sign up for emails. And if you're not getting your emails, look on your. I get it. I sometimes they end up in they end up in spam for me sometimes. So anyway, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being so attentive. And it was a pretty great night. And again, Carolyn has a still few, few books here. There's a few books here, and um, there's also a paper about a Beto event too. He's working hard to register voters. So thank you again, all of you, very very much. Thank you.